When I was a young student, I used to ask my professors, how do you practice? You probably do the same with your teachers. And then when I got older and I was in admiration of a fellow colleague, I used to ask them, how do you practice? And when I began to teach myself, I used to ask my pupils, how are you practicing? And then when I got even older still, I became rather suspicious of the answers that I'd been given in the past. So when I was professor of music at Indiana University, I decided to do a research project into private practice. Well, the only way to do that was to listen um, to people practicing in the practice rooms in the music school. And one of the things that became very obvious is that what people tell you they do and what they actually do when they practice are two entirely different things. Now, that's not to imply that they're telling you porkies when they say, that's what I do when I practice. Sometimes they don't know. And what they're doing during their practice time may be motivated by all sorts of things. Fears about tone, fears about a particular lazy finger, worried about the reed, feeling uncomfortable with the mouthpiece, a whole myriad of possibilities that are affecting what you do and what you think you ought to be doing. But nevertheless, what people told you they did or what they aspired to do and what they actually did during practice time, which was the beneficial period, we hope, was always entirely different. So one of the things I've done is I've formulated a little exercise to show you what I did in pure practical terms so that any piece of technical fluency could be mastered in about 10 minutes per day. There was a need to do that because if you're working and you've got pieces to learn for concerts at the end of the week or auditions or exams, there's a time frame and consequently it has to be measured out so that each part has equal attention and you don't end up playing a piece where you know the first six bars brilliantly and the last six bars you've never ever looked at. So here's the way I work. I've got three groups of semiquavers here. Actually, they're from the Nielsen Clarinet Concerto, and I've chosen them because they're particularly difficult from the finger movement point of view. But three, you can see with the black line there, three groups of four semiquavers. Now, the way I would work at this and to learn this so that I could play it up to speed in a very short space of time would be like this. I would repeat the first group as written, first four notes. Here we see it, this is group one. And I could play that repeatedly, slowly. I could do different rhythms, different staccato, different slurring, and even, importantly, different dynamics, because sometimes a change in dynamics can affect your tempo. Then I go on to the second group. Group two starts here, as you can see, and it's the next four notes, which would end there. One, two, three, four. That's my second group of four. And equally, I start working on that, perhaps 10, 15 times slowly with those variations. Then I go on to group three, which we can see starts here on the A flat and goes to the G there. One, two, three, four. And you can easily work this out for yourself, that you start a group of four on each successive note of the passage. And indeed, with 12 notes, three beats of four notes, you end up with nine exercises. You could do triplets, in which case you'd have 10 exercises. But as the, the, the rhythm and character of this piece is in groups of four, and it has a certain energy and character about it, that's why I've kept the exercises in groups of four. If you were to do that, perhaps 10, 12 times each day, just for 10 minutes, I would guarantee that that would not be a problem by the end of the week because you've given equal attention to every aspect of the piece, the way that groups connect, the way the finger movements connect going across the beats, and also having given equal attention, you're in no doubt as to what the notes are. So you're not fooled at that moment when the adrenaline's going and you've actually got to play it for real suddenly an accidental throws you, you're uncertain, and then the whole thing crashes and you can't play it and you've, you've made a mistake. 
So that's the process that I would use. And I'll, I'll just do a little bit of demonstrating now and you can follow on the, the manuscript as I play. So this may seem laboured, but it requires actually very little work because you give equal attention to every single aspect of the passage and therefore are never caught out by an unexpected accidental or a note that you don't know or a finger movement that seems unusual or strange. This method of working can be applied to anything. So if you've got a melody which has rather wide leaps and you're worried about the top notes blurting out or the intonation, Apply the same method, you will find it works just as successfully. So watch this, apply it to everything you do. It doesn't have to be semiquavers. Whatever the passage of music is, apply this. 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to play it.